Coming up on Digital Music Trends 217 on the 29th of January 2015, Zoe Keating's questions reignite the YouTube terms debate, Sony partners with Spotify and Shutter's Music Unlimited, Spotify's Touch Preview, iHeartRadio's numbers, the decline of Australian recorded music revenues, Sly Stone's royalties saga and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome two great guests to the show, uh, first of all uh, Jay Frank, founder of the label Big Scene, so hi Jay and thanks for joining me, how's it going? I'm doing great uh, Andre. how are you doing today? It's great to have you. Yeah, it's all, all good, really. Uh, we're having a, a bit of a rainy day here in London, but it's nothing compared to uh, what's going on in New York. So <laughs> I can't <laughs> complain, really. So, and then it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Ben Cesario, journalist at the New York Times. So hi, Ben, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Great. Thanks for having me back. It's a pleasure to have you. You're not in New York, though, are you? Well, oh, I am, yeah. Oh, you are. Cool. But it's, it hasn't been... I'm in Nashville. I'm the one who's not uh, not under snow right now in the U.S. Yeah, so we're, we're barely under snow here. It was, you know, it was it was a big nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, it shifted north, right? So it ended up hitting Boston more than New York in the end. Mm. Uh, I had some friends in Boston that were uh, posting pictures of snow drift. It was like a meter high. It was crazy. Uh, and yeah, so uh, from talking uh, about the weather to talking about other stuff, uh, we have quite a lot to uh, to go through uh, this week. Uh, but it should be quite a fun show. Uh, first of all, I want to open by talking about the story of the week, which is essentially Zoe Keating's uh, blog. And for those who don't know her, Zoe Keating is a fantastic cellist, uh, cellist, cellist, uh, who uh, um, uh, does independent work. She does uh, uh, sort of multi-layered uh, cello compositions, uh, and she's quite uh, a popular independent artist. Uh, she's been on the show actually a few months ago, and uh, she posted an interesting blog that essentially uh, re reignited the debate around YouTube music's. Uh, deals and the policy of YouTube when uh, dealing with independent artists. Uh, so uh, we talked uh, extensively last year about the, the indignation of in the independent uh, uh, music industry around some of the terms that were being forced upon uh, labels by Google. A lot of those issues were resolved though and at least for a while we didn't hear much about that especially after with the Taylor Swift to Spotify gate everybody was talking about Spotify instead of YouTube. And so uh, when uh, Zoe Keating uh, posted this blog last week uh, talking about the fact that those same conditions uh, were being imposed on her as an independent artist that raised uh, a whole uh, new debate. Uh, you know, the, the key points here, I mean, I, I don't want to essentially spend too much time uh, talking about the blog itself, uh, because I'm sure a lot of my listeners will have read about it. But there's two key issues here. Uh, the fact that uh, Kitty uh, realized that if she didn't sign the new contract, she would not be able to A, monetize her music on YouTube, and B, monetize her music via the content ID system. So essentially, either she agreed to YouTube's conditions, which included having to release uh, her music at the same time on YouTube as it, on any other platform. She couldn't essentially pre-release music anywhere else. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fact that uh, 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 all songs will, will be set to monetize even the, the ones that she doesn't want to. Uh, there's a, the whole host of conditions here, five-year contract, uh, uh, um you know, she wouldn't be able, to, if she didn't sign this contract, uh, she wouldn't be able to use content ID uh, or monetize music on YouTube. So uh, this has given rise to a plethora of responses. So first of all, I want to um, uh, sort of uh, uh, move it to you guys and, and ask you sort of what was, your, what, what was your knee-jerk reaction when you heard about this and uh, how do you think uh, YouTube is placed now uh, as opposed to last year when it comes to uh, YouTube music key and licenses? Uh, Jay? Well, I think... YouTube is in a tough position because they're not going to look good no matter which way they go, uh, especially when it comes to independent artists. I mean, part of the real root of the issue is how they use their content ID system. So this whole all or nothing thing is kind of important within the content ID system because right. if you say, well, I'm not going to include these 10 songs, but then somebody uses that song, then the content ID won't match it, and then the artist is gonna get upset because somebody's using the song illegally or they're not monetizing it. Similarly, it seems really disingenuous to suggest as an artist to be like, well, it's okay for my song to exist over here in a monetized or non-monetizable way within the YouTube system, but I won't let you use it over here. So, um, at some point, there's not really a good, clean way for YouTube to do this without looking bad for the independent artist. So, if you're, as so I've kind of found, if you're going to be in a situation where you're not going to look bad, you better, you might as well just go for everything that you need. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if I, I could ask, why is it disingenuous for an artist to sort of set conditions like that about how they want their music used? Well, I don't think it's necessarily disingenuous, but it, it needs to be uniformly enforced, you know, so that, uh, you know, that if it's, uh, you know, if, if you're going to say, well, I'm going to, you know, YouTube, let's be honest, YouTube with or without music key is, the, is one of the biggest on-demand music services out there. So if you're going to go and say, well, it can be on-demand over here as long as it's uh, used in this way, but then it's not going to be on demand over here. It's going to cause consumer confusion. It's going to cause confusion within their, their rights holders issues. How are they going to know in, in particular which ways it's going to be? And it just, it, it creates more confusion that, it, you know, it just makes for a lot more work. So I guess it, disingenuous may be the wrong word, but certainly it, it, it creates way more headaches than it needs to be, especially considering the level of a lot of activity a lot of these songs get. Yeah, so here essentially the, the issue is uh, the fact that, sh that I mean, the, the, one of the key issues is that around the, the, the pre-release as well, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, yeah. uh, the artist doesn't have a choice as to whether the music uh, goes on YouTube at all. Uh, if the, the deal term is that they have to put the music on YouTube uh, as it goes live on any other platform, that's really a key concern because it doesn't have anything to do with uh, confusing consumers. It's more to do with the fact that YouTube wants the music as soon as it's out. Is that I mean that definitely puts everybody in a in a very difficult position because an artist should have the right to be able, especially uh, on the outset, to be able to do exclusive deals with providers other than YouTube. But once the music's out, then people are going to go and attempt to put that music up on YouTube. And how is YouTube going to effectively be policing it without being in breach of their deal? It, it makes things very very difficult for them to manage. But, but then again, that's been a problem for YouTube since they turned on the lights. Yeah, that's true. Ben, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting to hear Jay's perspective because, in some ways, you um, you sort of see YouTube's point of view on this, and and you know you have a record company. Um, I mean, just from the outside, it, it seems that from the artist and from the label point of view, you know, control is really what it's all about, and the ability of the the artist or the a copyright holder to say this is what we want to do with our content, and this is how we want to do it seems like a pretty legitimate uh you know wish to have yeah. um and youtube's response it, it seems seems to be um well this is the way we want our system to work and if and if you know if you don't see that uh then it just makes things much more difficult for us and um and we can't have that yeah um, to me, that's a that's a tough position to hold. That um, that it's just impossible for them to accommodate the wishes of people who uh, you know want to use their service and from which they're going to make money. I Meaning, YouTube is going to make money. Um, you know, I mean, I guess I understand that. You know, I mean, the the, the one important. Uh, point to make, I think, on YouTube's point of view is they can't really have stuff on their service that they want to give away for free and then also charge people 10 bucks and have that free stuff disappear. Um, I think that's a legitimate point for YouTube to make that if they're going to charge people 10 bucks a month, they have to make sure that, you know, that there's some there's some expectation that they're also getting what would have been free. So there, there is, con right. I mean, I, I understand that that's, that's a confusing point that has to be sorted out, but um, the idea that, um, you know, we're YouTube and, and this is, you know, it's our way or the highway. And even if it's the highway, we still have all the content anyway. Um, I, I, I think that's a, um, you know, uh, I'd want to be careful choosing my words here, but I mean, I, I think that's a very sort of tough argument to make and, and claim that it's really fair. And, and I think that's what um, Zoe's uh, blog post was very interesting because um, in a way this isn't new, as you said. You know, we went through this almost a year ago exactly with the independent labels. I mean, the, the same points that she's complaining about were the same contract points um, that leaked out piece by piece uh, and that were objected to by by labels. Um, so she's making the same points, but um, she's really built up a lot of credibility as an artist. Yeah. And, and, you know, her willingness to be so open about everything about her business, I mean, down to um, showing the accounting of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of lines of an Excel spreadsheet of this is how many tenths of a penny I made from my streams. I think that's really given her a great deal of credibility. And so the fact that she 
went out personally and said, this is what's being told to me. I really want to know how I should deal with this problem. Yeah. Um, came across to me as a very honest way to, to, to deal with this. Yeah. Um, you know, this wasn't off the record leaks to journalists. This was her just saying, this is what's in my lap. I'm trying to figure out how I want to deal with this and whether it's really fair. Um, and it's also been very interesting to see the follow-ups over the last week. Absolutely. Um, you know, contesting her points, which she responds with detailed transcriptions. So, I mean, Zoe, whether whether you whether you think that you that YouTube is, you know has a good point or not, I think I think Zoe's position is very strong about I'm an artist and I have a right to um, deal with my work in a way that I want to deal with it. Yeah, and this is an interesting mm -hmm. point as well because uh, you know we're looking at an artist that is uh, entirely independent. You know, she. she uh, she does everything herself, essentially, but also an artist that is well known uh, 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 to a degree. And you know, somebody that, uh, as she points out herself, you know, she went to Davos and she even had a chat with Eric Schmidt directly, which is uh, not something that many artists can claim to have done. And uh, but uh, she's exactly in the same position as any other artist in the sense that she has no recourse to this. You know, she's been given the same script as uh, every other artist, presumably. And so. Uh, you know the fact that she has connections, or she, you know she's she's well known, doesn't put her in any better position. It just gives her a, a bit more of a of a of a, of a megaphone uh, to 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 shout uh, what's going on and to, and to let people know. What's yeah, going on. And, and, I think. And, good. Then. I, I think what's interesting about it is actually that she's not well known. Um, you know, I mean, this is not a uh, this is not of Taylor Swift. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, um, level I mean, artist. Well and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I mean, she's be, because of her advocacy. I think she's pretty well known in the digital music world um but you know i mean she's a very niche artist and she talks about that about how her view you know her videos don't have a ton of views but they're you know they're decent and like they make a little bit of money for her and that's part of how she makes her living um but i mean in the past few months it's interesting that between taylor swift versus spotify and zoe keating versus youtube there's a you know this is two ends of a huge spectrum. Yeah. Taylor Swift is, you know, the most famous artist in the world now. Um, and she took a very courageous stand, even, even being that famous and that rich. Um, I think it really was very courageous of her to stand up and sort of say, no, I don't, I don't want to do it your way. Yeah. Regardless um, of, regardless and, of the and, and, behind you know, it, yeah. one criticism about that whole thing was, well, you're Taylor Swift. You can kind of get away with doing that because you're so famous and rich and powerful. Um, I mean, Zoe Keating is the complete opposite end of that spectrum where she's not a global superstar who's going to make a million dollars a night on the road. Um, she's made it very clear that things like Bandcamp and YouTube and everything else, like this is incremental revenue that's very important for how she makes a living. Um, and so, you know, there's a complication about Taylor Swift also being on Spotify, but I, I, on, on YouTube. But I think the, there's an interesting point here about um, the size of an artist yeah. and and their ability to uh, make decisions, um, you know, whether they're a superstar or not. Yeah, and Jay, this kind of links up into you know the, the idea of, of a smaller label. You know, you, you guys are, are essentially an independent record label. Uh, you, we are in Nashville, and there's been a very interesting debate over the last few weeks around sort of what's happening to the middle class musicians in Nashville and what's causing, uh, you know what's happening there in the sense that some people are saying that that middle class is disappearing. And so uh, putting that into context, how, how do you feel uh, what Ben was saying around, you know, the size of the artist and, and how their, their voice can be heard uh, fits into this debate? And, and, and is there a way for artists that are as independent as Zoe is uh, and uh, working, working by themselves to uh, pull together and, and have their voices heard somehow? Well, I mean, you, you kind of bring up something that essentially creates probably about four or five different points. Exactly, and, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, and, I'm, and I want to put the, uh, the middle-class songwriter in Nashville off to the side because I'm yeah. actually doing some research on that right now and uh, uh, haven't uh, necessarily come to specific conclusions as to why that's occurring right now. Um, you know, I mean, you know, first off, just uh, to, to echo Ben's point, I mean, I met with Zoe a, a couple of years ago at Medem, and, uh, you know, as for, for somebody on the independent artist side to be a really strong advocate for this kind of things, um, you know, there's probably no, nobody who's better educated, smart, and articulate about it than Zoe is. I mean, she absolutely everything that Ben said, I mean, she knows her stuff when it comes to this stuff and is extraordinarily credible in terms of being able to uh, to make these criticisms. The, uh, you know, the difficult part, and again, just to stress, it's not that I'm for or against 
the way that YouTube is tackling this problem, um, although I think that uh, as many technology companies are, uh, they definitely don't take the emotional part into play and uh, you, you know, they can be completely right, but they'll say it in a way that makes it sound completely wrong because that's just typical of technology companies. Um, but uh, you know, in regards to you know, Zoe having control over her music, YouTube simultaneously should also be able to say that they can have control over the way they wish to run their network. And each party, each party can effectively go and say, I don't want to work. And, um, and I think the beauty about where we're at in music right now is that you can have that opportunity. If you say, geez, YouTube is cutting into my Bandcamp revenue, I'll go and take myself off of YouTube. And YouTube should do a, a, a good job, and they've, they're not perfect at it, but they've definitely gotten better over the years with their content ID system yeah. in making sure that certain content's not going to be there. I mean, it, it doesn't even just extend to, to YouTube. Last night, um, you know, there was a specific cat video that my daughter wanted to watch. And I went to go search for it on YouTube mobile and I couldn't find that cat video because it was on Vimeo and it wasn't on YouTube. Right. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they're much better at it than they were a couple of years ago. Um, you know, uh, you know, and so I think, you know, in regards to the control issue, absolutely, they should have control, but so should YouTube. That YouTube should be able to have, have that same control as well. Uh, the interesting point in, uh, in regards to streaming is that for the independent artists, they're fixated on the actual dollars and revenue coming in, in for the most part. And the tough part about streaming is that streaming is based on usage. And independent artists don't, uh, by, by the fact that they sometimes either make more challenging work or their work is not in the public eye as often, uh, is not going to be streamed as often and therefore is not going to make as much money, not because the, um, not because the, uh, the, the rate is low, but because the usage of it is low. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and in, in essence, people buying CDs and buying deluxe packaging is just a variation of the patronage model for independent artists. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that they're missing out on within uh, the streaming services. And some artists maybe shouldn't be on it because simply they, they, uh, they need to be subsisted through a, a more greater patronage model off of fewer fans. But the beauty about where we're at today is artists have so many different pathways to success, both uh, financial as well as emotionally that uh, you can choose and, and say, I can, I want to do this, I don't want to do this, and I think that that's one of the greatest things about uh, working with music today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th this is, to me, this is a really key point, and um, it's also very confusing, so maybe you could, you could help with this, but isn't sure. part of the problem um, simply that YouTube's demands are such that you can't say no thank you, I don't want to be on this. Because even if you say no thank you, they're still going to allow anybody to upload your video, meaning it will still be there on YouTube. And But not only will it be there even if you don't want it to be there, but you won't be able to make money from it being there. And well, I mean, YouTube's kind of got this middle ground. And, uh, well, I, I should scratch that. I mean, the, as, as I understand it, if you say, I don't want to be on YouTube, I think YouTube is just not the place for me. You can go upload all your material into the content ID system and say, every time this song appears, whether it's on my official video, whether it's on a cat video, whether it's on a news clip, this video will be stricken from YouTube. And that content ID system has proven itself to be better and better as every year goes on. So this is that how is Prince possible. does it? Sorry? Is that how Prince does it? Um, or does I've Prince have to have so. somebody sending takedown notices every day? Um, I've got to believe so. And again, it's not to say that it is perfect. There are definitely times when it slips through the system, but it is it is it is vastly improved from where it was a couple of years ago. Um, I think the, the issue in terms of the, uh, what Zoe's trying to point out is Zoe's possibly saying, hey, I want to keep my YouTube channel up with my selection of the videos that I want uh, that's hand curated for my catalog. But I don't want to be on Music Key and have to go and uh, be a part of this whole system where everything has to go up. Yeah. And, um, and that's, the, that's the middle ground part that I think 
as I understood it, that she wants to achieve that YouTube won't let her be participating in. And, um, you know, look, she's, you know, YouTube is powerful enough that she's right. It would be an ideal world to, to have that situation. But, you know, again, in my opinion, if, if Zoe's allowed to have the choice of where her music should go, then YouTube should also have, be allowed to have the choice of how they want to distribute content, music, video games, or otherwise. Right. That's some very good point, guys, and I think uh, you know we can probably close the debate on that there. But uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about it in the, next, in the coming weeks, uh, and hopefully we'll hear a few more artists share their experience as to uh, what the, the deal is with YouTube and, and perhaps uh, uh, corroborate some of the uh, things that, that Zoe has been talking about. And uh, one of the stories that has broken literally in the last half hour, and it's a pretty I I important story, is the fact that uh, Spotify has uh, launched a, a brand new partnership, a, a, a large scale partnership with a place. PlayStation Network with Sony, and uh, essentially it's uh, bringing in a partner with a, you know a, a partner with a cloud. Uh, Sony, of course, has got a lot of muscle and a big network on the play PlayStation Network. And what they're going to do is essentially integrate in to some degree uh, and create a new service called PlayStation Music, uh, where essentially PlayStation users will be able to subscribe to Spotify Premium paying with their PlayStation account, and then the Spotify's music will essentially flow into PlayStation Music and will be available for users to uh, stream whilst they're playing games as well. So uh, this also means that uh, PlayStation, uh, that Sony will shutter its uh, Sony Music Connected service, uh, which was uh, been available for a few years now. It was a big part of Sony's plans on the content uh, front, uh, and uh, uh, but it didn't go particularly well. It was powered by uh, Omniphone, I believe, and uh, uh, that is going to be shut down as soon as this uh, new uh, PlayStation Music service launches. It's interesting because it looks like a bit of a white label service in a sense, uh, even though it doesn't go quite as far as a white labeling uh, of Spotify. Uh, and it's also a big coup for Spotify because it's 41 countries uh, roll out and, you know, uh, uh, tens of hundreds of millions of users of, of a PlayStation network. So uh, definitely a big potential pool of, of customers there. Uh, you know, what, what do you guys make of this? It's very fresh. So I know I probably haven't even heard about it yet, but, uh, you know, the, uh, do you think that uh, we're going to see uh, more of this uh, and was Spotify right in doing this deal? Well, I think that there's two things. I mean, I saw the uh, I saw the release just before we, we got online and already had started to have a quick conversation with somebody about it. Uh, you know, my first instinct is Music Unlimited dis didn't succeed, so I don't know exactly how much additive it's going to be just because Spotify is going to occupy the same slot. Right. Uh, you know, there, there's a uh, there's a suggestion within that that uh, the, the PlayStation Network may not actually have a very robust amount of users. Uh, but that being said, maybe the Spotify brand name will help to uh, to to move that forward. Uh, what's interesting is we've been noticing some signs in the last six months to a year that very quietly Xbox Music. Um, because of the nature with their Xbox One and with uh, the way that it's integrated into the Windows system, has been very quietly growing and gaining what I won't call a major foothold, but a, a noticeable foothold. And, uh, you know, as a business, we're starting to keep our eye on that a little bit more seriously than we might have uh, six months to a year ago. And it certainly suggests that the gaming network is a great distribution method to be able to, uh, to increase uh, music consumption. So, you know, within that backdrop, uh, you know, I'm very optimistic optimistic that this uh, that this partnership is going to yield some some great results and better results than they had within uh, Music Unlimited especially because some of those people may already be Spotify customers so it just gives them an extra opportunity to uh, to listen to more music uh, and, and utilize their subscriptions more exactly as you said you know a lot of these people may be s s people that listen to Spotify on the free version and so that might give them a, a, an opportunity to upgrade yeah absolutely Spotify, actually, the, the last thing I wanted to ask you guys was, uh, have, you, have you tried out the uh, Spotify Touch feature on iOS? I don't know if you are on iOS or Android devices, uh, but uh, I really love it. I was surprised by how much I liked it. It's the first time that I actually went wow to a Spotify feature before it kind of, I'm, I'm always kind of like meh or expecting the feature to come out. Uh, so I don't know if you, if you guys have any thoughts or have tried it out. I haven't yet. Um, I will. I mean, this is... This isn't uh, an, an aside, but I'm also curious about this Snapchat um, deal, yeah. content deal that they call Discover. Uh, so far, Warner Music is the only music company on it, um, and who knows how this will work. But uh, you know, I'm just I'm intrigued by it just because of the the scale of Snapchat, and you know, the idea that this sounds like a very different kind of 
you know, of content streaming model than we've seen uh, from, you know, anywhere else. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to me that after quite a few years now of feeling like every time somebody launches a new service, it feels like some new kind of iteration of the Spotify model or the Pandora model or really, you know, we weren't seeing a huge amount of innovation. Um, I'm curious about how this is going to play out because I, it sounds it sounds different. And in the same way that, say, like Vessel, um, you know, is a is a, a novel twist on some of the video deals we've seen. Um, I you know I wonder if this year we're going to really start seeing some big changes and just sort of what some of these content streaming deals are going to look like. Yeah, an interesting thing also is to point out, point out that Warner Music is the only major that is not a part of Vivo. So interesting to see that right. make, make them a side deal. Uh, with Snapchat to get their video content on there. Why? I don't think that's a coincidence. I, no, I think probably that's. Not. Yeah, yeah I, I would have to agree on that, and I and I agree with Ben. I mean, I we've been, uh, you know, as a, as a company, we've been waiting to see. Okay, is there more? And you know, Snapchat being the big one, but in general, with you know, you know, just individual messaging services, as uh, as teenagers in particular are moving to spend more time on those versus more broad-based social networks, it makes the job of marketing artists harder. So, uh, and, uh, so you know, having something like this, I'm very, very intrigued by it. Uh, in regards to the, um, the touch feature, um, I haven't had a chance to play around with it yet, uh, but I, I will say as a, as, a, as a label owner, I'm actually not happy with it, mainly because uh, it's a way to circumvent royalties. Um, right, exactly. You know, That's uh, what I was thinking. You know, thir- 30 second samples are not anything that we would get paid on. Now within the uh, paid environment, it doesn't necessarily really matter too much because you're going to get the same chunk of money being paid out to everybody. But as an independent label, we're going to have a much higher percentage of people discovering our music than a major label who is going to have a lot of people who are already aware of their catalog. So if the discovery process moves from somebody to say, hey, you know, we have, a, you know, an act, uh, Paradise Fears. Hey, I just heard the new, I heard about this band, Paradise Fears. Let me go check them out. They go to listen to it now on Spotify and they'll have a good chance of, if they're kind of addicted to it, at least giving it maybe 40, 45 seconds. And whether it's paid or not, we'll get paid for that. If on the other hand, they're put into an environment that limits them to a 30 second sample, then we're never gonna get paid unless they actively like it enough to move to the next step. And what we've seen with consumers is most of them aren't. So I get why it works for consumers, I get why why it works within Spotify, but I think for, for um, artists and labels, and in particular independent labels like ourselves, I'm not exactly keen on it because I think it could adversely affect some of our revenue. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, I, I, from my own music consumption, I thought it was a positive move in terms of uh, finding new artists because uh, you know, if I if I browse through Spotify's new releases page or uh, into a genre page, for example, it allows me to. Uh, literally give a super quick sample of, of the albums that are coming out that I wouldn't necessarily be able to queue in my in my in my queue because it's just too much stuff to listen to and literally you know spend 10 minutes listening to like 50 uh, albums worth of snippets and sort of realize you know maybe five that I think it's a sound that I like and it's kind of thing that I, I would listen to and, and add them to my queue so it kind of helps me uh, discover more music than I would otherwise uh, but that's because I make an, a, a very you know, direct attempt at doing that, whilst a lot of users, as you say, Jay, might just be looking for that specific band and then might not actually end up streaming the whole track. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting on that point, uh, and uh, and yeah. So, but uh, check it out if you are if you are home and you have an iOS device and a Spotify app. Uh, you essentially just need to uh, keep your finger on uh, the icon of the album, and essentially all the tracks pop up. Uh, and you, as long as you keep your finger on it, you can essentially stream up to thirty seconds of each track and sample uh, the album or the playlist. It's also quite handy if you're looking at a playlist and it says, you know. Uh, electronic uh, concentration music, or I don't know, some, some random stuff, and you're trying to figure out what kind of tracks are in that playlist, and you can just uh, have a quick check and, and see if it's, if it's music that you are actually going to like. And, uh, you know, one of the stories that came up this, today that was a little bit uh, of, a, of a bummer, uh, in a sense, uh, was the fact that uh, the Australian music industry has registered another 10% decline over uh, in 2014, over 2013, and in 2013 it had registered uh, an 116 almost 12% decline over 2012. So, you know, 
we're looking here at a, a 40 plus percent decline over the last nine years, uh, almost 30 percent of that uh, just over the last five years. Uh, essentially, the industry in Australia seems to be in free fall, whilst in, in most other countries, it's kind of stabilized uh, in, in the in the big music economies. Uh, you know, the only place where we've seen a, a you know a bit of a decline was uh, Japan, but for obvious reasons around uh, uh, sort of physical music sales. Uh, so I don't know. It's kind of a uh, I'm kind of uh, unsure as to how to take this story. Uh, Arias sort of refuses to give uh, particular reasons, as, or it doesn't provide any particular insights as to uh, what is happening to the to the music market. Streaming is growing by 111% on the subscription front, but uh, ad-supported streaming revenues actually declined by 13%, which is a surprise. And uh, and, and uh, the album uh, album sales uh, fell, uh, you know, physical sales fell by 18.4%. So uh, I don't know, Jay if you have any any insights on on on, uh, on your end uh, from the label uh, on, on what's going on in australia uh, and uh, you know I, I really don't have anything to say around why this is happening it just seems to be i don't know a, a number yeah. of factors well i mean i think I, I mean i can't speak to specifically why australia is um you know is is is, is losing uh is losing revenue uh, you know what I can say is a lot of the, a lot that I've seen in, in, in my analysis over the last decade and a half has always been that the reasons for decline are complex and they're never as simple as just a oh it's blame it all on streaming music um, you know it's uh, you know there's all you know like was there you know has there you know did, you know as an example the you know the number of record store closures that we experienced in uh, in North America in the early and mid 2000s maybe stores managed to hold on for a lot longer in Australia and they really just started closing in 2011 2012 and so what we're actually seeing is maybe more a ripple effect of uh, that the physical sales held on a little bit longer than they might uh, than they than they might have done otherwise uh, another example of something that could uh, be a reason is just that. Um, you know, within the streaming devices, is there enough partnerships with mobile carriers? Um, you know, have they have they spent the amount of time marketing it? Are they doing the right, uh, you know, the right collaborations? Uh, certainly, there's some signs that say says that they are. I know that in Australia, the uh, the triple. A playlist on Spotify in particular is very, very popular. So one would suggest that there's a good tie-in between radio and uh, and streaming services. But uh, but typically, you know, it's it's usually a lot more complex and nuanced, and not just a, as simple as just saying, "Well, everybody wanted to stop buying music." There's probably a, a host of factors going. And uh, the irony, of course, uh, is that I think that after a lot of time uh, that I can recall. Uh, music that's being exported out of Australia is actually on the rise. I mean, you have uh, the Shepherd record, which I believe they're Australian, the Vance Joy record, and so there's actually more acts actually starting to come out of the continent now uh, than had ever been before. So it's kind of ironic that while that business, uh, you know, locally is doing uh, poorly, it's happening at a time that uh, that artists are actually uh, starting to become more better global exports. Yeah, interesting. Uh, you know, Australia is a market that is actually quite a small market in terms of the number of people that, that you know live there, really. Uh, but uh, uh, we we were talking last year about the fact that there's such a, a huge number of streaming services. It's just hard to understand how any of them can scale, just because of the population factor. It just doesn't seem to be enough people to be able to cater for all. Like, there's I think there's like 15 services, 15 different streaming services or something uh, that are available over there. So uh, another interesting thing to take into account is the fact that Australia is not, uh, you know, a particularly populous continent. And so, you know, the, 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 there's a finite amount of money that people can spend on music. And it seems like they found uh, other things to spend their money on, essentially, uh, over the last few years. Uh, but Bennett, do you, do you have any insights on Australia or do you want to move on to the next, next story? I don't. I don't really know anything about Australia, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I knew more. Yeah, I wish mm -hmm. I'd been. I, I, I haven't even been, so yeah, I can't, I can't speak to that. Uh, and uh, um, you know, in, uh, I wanted to qu just quickly move uh, to talk about uh, uh, iHeartRadio. So iHeartRadio, a uh, US uh, company, so definitely worth uh, spending a couple of minutes on this one uh, this week uh, with you guys. Uh, uh, you know, they uh, they uh, announced that they surpassed sixty million registered users and five hundred million app downloads. Uh, if, you know. As usual, the, the usual sort of uh, start of the year press release just to, to try and, uh, and uh, uh, perk up the, the morale uh, around the company. You know, uh, it seems to be doing pretty well. Uh, brand awareness has grown to 75%. Uh, Clear Channel has changed its entire uh, name to iHeartMedia. So again, that reinforced uh, uh, the branding of, 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 the, uh, of the service uh, and it, it connected to a bunch of new devices. So things seem to be 
going well for iHeartRadio. At the same time, it's still you know far behind uh, Pandora in terms of uh, users. At the same time, I'm seeing sort of Pandora as uh, uh, remaining a little bit stuck in in a rut in, uh, as far as the service is concerned. It's, it it doesn't look like it's offering a lot more beyond music yet. Uh, it hasn't integrated a lot of extras, uh, you know, podcast radio programs, uh, uh, weather news. There's not a lot available on Pandora. Whilst iHeartRadio is really uh, making a big push to provide those services, which could be appealing for car users. So uh, I don't know, Ben. How do you feel about those two companies? Do you think that uh, iHeartRadio Ra- Heart could uh, catch up on Pandora slowly by providing those extra services? I don't know if it's about the extra services so much, um, but I, I do think it's a possibility that iHeartRadio in general just will become, um, you know, a bigger competitor. Um, e- even though, even though their numbers have, you know, even though the number sixty million is a, is an impressive one, I think if you drill down into usage numbers yeah. as tracked by. Uh, you know, I think Triton is the company that tracks that. They're, you know, they really haven't grown that much in the last couple of, of years. That when they, when Pittman took over and they pushed hard to restart this, they really grew very fast. And you have to remember that they have 800 radio stations around the country where they can push the name iHeartRadio every time there's a commercial break. And, you know, they do it constantly. So, they were they were able to establish that name pretty quickly. Um, I think the more interesting thing about what you're asking about is is Pandora stuck in a rut? Um, you know, I mean, they they've their growth has been phenomenal, but in the last you know whatever six to eight months, really it slowed down. Um, they haven't updated their number with anything. Um, you know, in a, in a while, um, and the service itself kind of just looks like it's aging. Um, so, you know, I think it's more about it, you know, is can it will inertia kind of catch up to 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 Pandora um, as everybody else kind of grows up around them. So, yeah. um, I mean, at the moment, you know, um, it's kind of amazing how Pandora has like, you know, withstood every storm that has come its way i mean i you know itunes radio didn't do anything to it um the launch of iheart radio even though it grew very fast didn't do anything to it um but now we're starting to see pandora as you said just kind of stall they, they seem to just sort of be stuck where they are maybe that's the limit of how far they're they're able to grow um yeah. but it's an interesting question for for this year yeah, and we've seen, like, you know, Deezer has purchased uh, uh, TuneIn, for example. We've seen some interesting integrations there. No, St- Stitcher, sorry. Uh, Deezer purchased Stitcher. So there's interesting integration between music services and, and uh, 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 you know, uh, spoken uh, words, uh, you know, providers. And so uh, I'm, I would like to see Pandora perhaps uh, move a little bit more in that direction and, and allow some integration between, between the two. Uh, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, uh, Jay, from, from your end, uh, you know, do, do you use either of the services? And, uh, uh, you know, can you see the functionality of iHeartRadio sort of uh, surpass Pandora just in terms of sheer, sheer uh, uh, you know, flexibility uh, for users? I, I mean, I think this is going to be a very interesting year on that front. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I agree with Ben's assessment in terms of looking at the Triton uh, metrics that you know, uh, iHeart really rose fast, and then they seem to be stuck in terms of a usage rut. Um, at the same time, I can you know just speaking from you know revenues, and actually have been watching as the sound exchange revenue from iHeart has been creeping up to uh, to rival, and in some cases surpass Pandora revenue for us on certain mm-hmm. titles. So uh, so that's been interesting to uh, to to watch as well. Um, Pandora itself, um, you know, in, in hiring uh, Lars Murray and Jason Feinberg last summer, um, you know, I think, and, and having had conversations with both of them over the last few months, I think the good thing is Pandora has recognized the fact that they're stuck in a rut and they're trying to do something about it. And I've had long-standing issues with uh, with Pandora, and in particular with their music genome, and uh, um, and I think that as a company, they are now starting to say we've got to address some of those issues on multiple fronts if we're going to succeed and kind of get over the hump that they're at. So yeah. whether they succeed or not is still TBD, but I think that as a company, they are trying to address it and trying to move forward. Um, but you know, when you brought up the point of saying, well, what, how has Pandora managed to stay, uh, hang in there over all these years, and how is uh, you know where is iHeartRadio's greatest, greatest potential? To me, the name of the game, and this goes back to what we were talking about with Spotify. And, uh, and PlayStation 
is distribution. Most people, especially given the confusion of 15 different services and a lot of different things, they really have, when you get down to most consumers, it's just whatever you put in front of them. So, you know, I buy an Xbox, I listen, I play Xbox all day, Xbox music is right there, I might use that. Um, I bought a connected TV, the connected TV has Pandora, I'm going to use that. Uh, you know, it remains to be seen on Apple devices, do they preload the beat service as they do iTunes, and so people are just going to automatically start using that. Um, and I think iHeart's real next big win, which I think is why they reposition themselves, is they're really just placing themselves for the connected car. Their next big bump up is really going to be their ability to get distribution within the connected vehicles so that they just seamlessly transition from uh, FM radio to, uh, to a button that is carried over, uh, over wireless signals. So, um, you know, I think everything really just comes down to the distribution deals that all of these carriers, uh, all of these services put together and, uh, and, uh, and the more that those happen, I think the more that they'll start to find uh, certain growth opportunities. Right, right. Now that makes sense and uh, exciting to see what's going to happen at, at, at both companies over the, over the next 12 months as, as you said. And uh, finally uh, there was an interesting story around uh, uh, one of the uh, just I uh, wanted to touch on uh, essentially Sly Stone's lawsuit against his uh, uh, former manager and, and uh, attor attorney. Uh, so uh, he managed to finally after a five-year lawsuit uh, get a five million uh, uh, judgment in his favor, uh, where he's going to recover essentially some of the royalties that weren't paid to him. This is a pretty extraordinary story, just because uh, essentially Sly Stone is now 71. He filed the lawsuit in 2010, and apparently he didn't receive a cent in royalties between 1989 and 2000. And for those of you who might not know who he is, you know he he was uh, part of the group as the Family Stone, producing evergreen hits like Everyday People, Dance to the Music, and Family Affairs, sort of kind of the wedding staples and, and you know the staples of a lot of different types of celebrations. So uh, definitely tracks that uh, kept earning uh, royalties all through the years. Uh, and the, the lawsuit was originally filed for asking for 50 million, and the award of five million is considerably less, but still a victory for uh, somebody that. Uh, can probably look now at uh, uh, living out his retirement pretty comfortably. Uh, so, uh, you no, know, not really. I mean, I mean, and I think it should be pointed out that the, uh, the one of the things that I noted is, is that the uh, the ex managers are planning to appeal, and that appeals process is probably going to add another two or three years to the process. So, right. while uh, you know while he's uh, you know been awarded five million dollars, it still may be a couple of years before he's going to get it. Which is awful. It's one of those uh, rec recording industry horror stories that uh, you know we don't hear that much. You know that many of them anymore, but uh, the, the the old sort of disasters of the recording industry still drag on, and the horrible relationships with, between managers and, and, and artists that have formed over the years. Uh, I, I don't know. The, I, I think you know today we've gone past that. I haven't heard a lot of horror stories over the last few years around these kind of things happening. There's a lot. There's a lot more transparency, and as as much as you know, we like to whinge about uh, digital services and the fact that we can't really tell exactly where the money's coming from or what's going on. But uh, yeah, th you know, do you think that this kind of behavior is over, or are there always going to be managers that manage to to uh, you know fob artists off with a horrible deal or labels that can do that as well? Uh, boy, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on this one. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, for for one thing, um, I'm I'm looking into that, and I I think there may be a little more to to this case than 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 as stated. Ooh, intriguing, um, exciting. You know, and uh, and I think that um, I mean I think it like it's not just a matter of the of the uh, the other side appealing it. I think that the you know there's still the issue of. A jury's um, a jury's damages award can be reduced by the judge, and that right. might very well happen here. So the headline of five million dollars, you know, might not hold up. It's we'll, questionable. We'll see. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much yeah. for the contribution. I, I I think to 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 answer your question, I mean, I think it's if it's the music business, it's going to attract some people who are going to prey on the desires of people's. Uh, uh, want of fame, um, so I think that no matter what happens, there's uh, there's going to be increasing. Uh, I would say since they increase, there will always be something uh, in the mix. Um, I think the interesting part in talking to certain people is that while there is greater transparency in certain areas, there's also uh, there's also uh, a greater potential for a lack of transparency in the sense that people don't know what's missing if they don't know to look for it. You know, one could go and look at a statement to say, "Oh yes, I'm supposed to." get this money from uh, Spotify, and I'm supposed to go get this money from iTunes, and then uh, completely forget to 
to go and uh, file a sound exchange, or maybe they forgot to ask about the sound exchange mine, uh, or recognizing that there's a service called Deezer, and for whatever reason, a radio station in France started playing them, and they became popular, and they blew up in, uh, on Deezer in France. There's a lot of opportunities because it has been so... Uh, there are so many different places that I think there's uh, there's there is a greater potential essentially to have money be hidden if you don't know what you're looking for, and that's uh, I think going to be a, probably a burgeoning business for for those of us that are trying to to be respectful of, of artists getting their fair share to uh, just be 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 there to point out. I mean, I had one artist that I worked with who had completely forgotten that they had put an old album up on TuneCore, and there was 18 months of TuneCore revenue just sitting there waiting for them to take. Um, you know, so there's uh, there's always uh, uh, you know I, I think that th there is greater transparency, but there's there's greater ability to to essentially uh, hide the money as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I I mean I I just I I don't want to make a broad pronouncement about you know predicting that music that all record companies are scumbags or something like that. I, yeah. I just um, but I just want to point out that you know. Um, there's a long and uh, you know ignominious history here of, um, of of artists complaining about being ripped off by whether it's record companies or their managers or others in the business. Like this, this is you know this didn't start uh, with Sly Stone's lawsuit. We all we all know that. Absolutely. And I think Jay is exactly right that you know hey, if it happened, if it's happened 50 times before, it's going to happen 50 times again. I think it's a very interesting question about. Are, are things more transparent or not? I mean, there is more data than there used to be. There's more of a possibility of being transparent. Um, but is the business more transparent? Um, I don't know. This, the, Jay, maybe you would have a thought about that. I mean, this is something that um, I hear about every once in a while. Somebody whispers something in my ear about their royalty statements, and they, you know, sometimes they, you know, just because you get a royalty statement that's 50 pages long and there's a lot of data on it, I get the sense that people don't necessarily believe that all this information is correct and that there's not that there's not a thumb on the scale somewhere or that uh, that there's not an agency that is not you know reporting everything uh, in full. So uh, I'm curious about within the music industry what you think about that. Well, I think it, it, it kind of depends. The um, uh, you know, I think you know. First off, I think the operative word is more transparent, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean completely. Um, you know, I think it's just you know, as an example, like uh, you know, twenty years ago, I might have I might worry that my distributor might go manufacture another thousand records, ship it on a boat to go overseas, and never report it to me, uh, and and just make money off of it. And how am I going to find out? But now I can go and get direct revenue, and I can actually see penny for penny, dollar for dollar. All of these, uh, all of the money that comes in from various countries, and more to the point, countries that are probably never would have monetized before that I can get monetization from, um, you know, are in that mix. Some of them 100% accurate. I hope so. But to your point, how am I ever going to know? How is anyone really going to be ever ever able to audit Spotify or Pandora or anybody else? It's 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 very very difficult. Uh, uh, to do so, but I, I think in, in the in the spirit of everything, I think that there is there's greater transparency, and that leads to a greater level of honesty. But I probably wouldn't put it at a hundred percent. Now, it's worth noting. I should say that I mentioned that on the master side of things, on the publishing and songwriting side of things, I think that I, I my instinct says there is funny business going on. I just don't know exactly where. Uh, just because uh, when I when I kind of look at Spotify's uh, numbers of subscribers and my revenue and seeing what goes on in the site, things match up fairly closely. When I go and take that and compare that against my publishing statement, they don't match up nearly as neatly. And, um, and the first place that I go to is not necessarily Spotify. I think Spotify is showing me through the master reporting revenue that they, they seem to be fairly on the up and up. I worry about all the people that are in the middle between me getting my money and then actually receiving it. Because if, you know, great, I got all this airplay or all the Spotify play from Sweden. Fantastic. Well, how many people touch that publishing money when it comes from Sweden over to the United States? And are they being honest in terms of the reporting as it works its way down the funnel? That I'm not 100% certain of. And so I think that's an area that I think can, can have greater transparency and, if, and, and even more than transparency, probably a greater ability to collapse the system to eliminate uh, some of the middlemen to, uh, 
to improve uh, to improve the accuracy of the, the figures that are heading the way of songwriters. That's uh, that's yeah, some fantastic points there. Thanks, Jay, and uh, I think that's a good uh, note to end the show on. Uh, I just wanted to point out a couple of stories that we didn't manage to talk about. Uh, first of all, Pro Tools launched uh, uh, is going to launch a free version, so if you have uh, been itching to use Pro Tools but uh, can't afford it or you know didn't want to spend money on it, you can try out a free version, uh, or it's going to launch in, in a few months anyway. Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, Impala, the European uh, label uh, representative uh, organization, has launched a ten-point digital action plan, uh, which uh, essentially calls for a new European industrial politics uh, to drive the uh, uh, digital market through the cultural and creative sectors. They outlined 10 points around that and also remarked on, on some of the issues around uh, copyright transparency as we we're talking about just now. And uh, finally, uh, there's an inter inter interesting publication on musictank.co.uk uh, that is essentially an MA thesis of one of the students uh, on the subject of big data. And uh, you can go and check it out. And it's also a link to an event which is called uh, uh, Moneyballing Music. Uh, and, and this is all called Moneyballing Music Insight uh, Paper uh, around Around data uh, music and how majors can make use of the data to uh, essentially uh, further their business and uh, that's all for this week uh, Jay first of all uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on your end and if there's any artists that you'd like to plug or uh, lead our listeners to go and check out yeah sure I mean we've been uh, we've uh, you know our label has been growing digs in um, and uh, you can uh, download any of the tracks from our artists like Paradise Fears like Swimming or Bronze Radio Return at digsin.com you can just give us your email address and get it for free uh, we've also been having uh, just a lot of great success in the Spotify world as I've been mentioning and certainly go and check out our playlists and, and follow a whole bunch of playlists that are featuring our songs out there and uh, uh, yeah we've been just, uh, just doing a lot of, you know also it's worth mentioning we're doing a lot of work at as, a, as an independent uh, marketing company where we're doing a lot of playlist plugging for Spotify, which as, as we've understood, we're the first company out there to actually offer uh, playlist plugging for artists all around the world. Uh, and so we have those services available and that's working really well. And uh, you can always hit me up on Twitter at Future Hit DNA. Excellent. And uh, after spending half of the show uh, slamming YouTube, it's very exciting to hear that you guys are going to get Google Fiber. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, actually, the office is getting Google Fiber, but my, my home is just a mile outside the zone, so unfortunately, oh, wow. I won't get it in my house. That is, move. That is unfortunate. What's uh, that going to yeah. do to real estate prices? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I didn't think of that. <laughs> and Ben, uh, on your side, uh, any pieces you're working on or anything you want to point people to? Um, not that I can mention at the moment, but, you know, a few keep, things you mentioned keep through the show. Out the website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's great. And you can follow Ben on at Cesario on Twitter for all the latest updates or uh, search for him on the New York Times website. You'll find all uh, his pieces uh, lined up. And thanks so much for joining me, guys. It was a, a real pleasure having you on this week. And uh, thanks so much for listening to the show. It comes out every week. You can find it on digitalmusictrends.com where you can also sign up to the weekly newsletter. Also, if you are a podcast fan, do download uh, uh, the show on your phone through one of the podcasting apps rather than streaming it on services because then it means that you can listen to it on the go. And you can probably get through the whole hour uh, while you're commuting or doing something else thanks so much for listening have a fantastic week and uh, till next